I'm pleased to announce Morris Thurston. I was uh, lucky enough to be in his home for one of the, they, they do programs down in Southern California with the, Mikla, the Miller Eccles uh, Society Foundation? Study group. Study group, okay. And I was, I was in his home and, and had a good chance to talk with him and, and meet with him. Uh, he has a, a very s strong bio and I encourage you to look in the program to read his bio. And with that, I'm just going to turn the time over to him to give as much time as possible. Thank you. Thank you all. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, you know, it's that time of the afternoon when uh, uh, I typically take a nap. And uh, I'm thinking that perhaps a number of you have planned the same thing. Uh, I'm going to try to interfere with your nap plans by talking about something that I hope will be a lot of fun. Uh, some of the things that we hear today or here at these, these sorts of conferences aren't fun, they're educational. Uh, I'm hoping this will be both. My wife, Dawn, and I often lecture on writing life stories. She teaches memoir writing. And in fact, we've got a book, I'll do a shameless plug for it, uh, called Breathe Life Into Your Life Story. And so what I'm going to try to do today is practice what I preach by breathing life into the story of Joseph Smith. And to do that, and the thing that we teach our students, uh, you need to be able to tell the story as it is from all sides. A character that is nothing but good or nothing but evil is not a real character, is not a human being. And Joseph Smith was certainly real and certainly human. Um, <clears throat> this particular tale I call The Kidnapping at Palestine Grove. And I put kidnapping in quotes because it depends on which side of the fence you stand as to whether it was a kidnap or an arrest. What I'm I find this, this story so interesting that I think it deserves some sort of a movie. And so I'm taking uh, the opportunity right now, you'll hopefully, if this clicker is working correctly, see some magic happening on the, on the boards. I'm going to try to present this as though I'm writing a screenplay for a movie. And I want you to visualize this as though you're seeing a full color movie. I didn't have the production budget to make it such. In fact, my idea of this movie is to have some pretty outstanding actors and actresses play the lead roles. And I, I'm going to present those to you as we go along. <clears throat> this story has the excitement, the danger, the bravado, and the humor. It strengthens my respect for Joseph because it illustrates his vulnerability, his intelligence, his persistence, and his outspokenness. In other words, it does make him human. So, scene one, the Wasson home, Palestine Grove, Illinois. Picture this scene with me. Joseph and Emma Smith and their children are visiting at the home of Benjamin and Elizabeth Wasson in Palestine Grove, Illinois, nearly 200 miles northeast of Nauvoo. Elizabeth is Emma's sister. Several of Emma's other siblings also reside in the area. For Joseph, it is an opportunity not only to visit with relatives, but also to preach to the citizens of Lee County. It is a much anticipated visit for the children as well, who have an opportunity to reacquaint themselves with their cousins. At about 2 o'clock p.m., when the Smith and Wasson families are seated at dinner, a knock is heard on the front door. Two men, claiming to be Mormon elders, ask if the prophet is in. In truth, the visitors are not Mormons at all, but lawmen. Joseph Reynolds, Sheriff of Jackson County, Illinois, or Jackson County, Missouri, and Harmon Wilson, Constable of Carthage. 
Their mission is to arrest Joseph Smith and transport him to Missouri to stand trial on charges of treason. Their arrival is not altogether unexpected. Therefore, while the Wassons are trying to convince the bogus elders that Joseph is not in, the prophet is slipping out a back door and hobbling through an open field toward the woods some distance away. As Reynolds persists in his questioning, Wilson moves toward the corner of the house where he has a good view of the fields beyond. As he does so, he spots Joseph on the run some 200 yards distance. Wilson gives a whoop and takes off in pursuit, with Reynolds following. The lawmen, being lighter and more nimble afoot, are gaining on the prophet when Joseph passes an old cabin and suddenly disappears from sight. Wilson arrives at the cabin first, but to his chagrin, the fugitive is nowhere to be seen. After briefly considering the cabin and a nearby well as possible hiding places, Wilson notices some bedding that has been spread over the tall grass to, to dry. Looking closely, he sees a pair of boots protruding, and so he springs on the blanket and shouts at Reynolds to come on. As Wilson later accounted the story, the man in the boots soon emerges from his hiding place and stands before us as our prisoner, assuring his, us of his surrender. Now what I've told you is Wilson's story. In Joseph's version, which differs slightly, he is, quote, in the yard going to the barn when the lawmen see him. Wilson accosts Joseph in an uncouth and ungentlemanly manner, and both lawmen, without showing any legal papers, forcefully push their cocked pistols to his chest. Reynolds shouts, Damn you! If you stir one inch, I'll shoot you. Be still, or I'll shoot you by damn. And I've actually left out a few swear words that are in the history of the church. I suppose if I were at Sunstone, I would have included them. <laughs> Joseph calmly replies, I'm not afraid to die, and proceeds to pull his shirt open, revealing his chest, and offers the lawmen a clean shot. Declining the invitation to shoot, the lawmen march Smith back to their wagon and are about to hustle him off without giving him a chance to say farewell to his family. One of Joseph's bodyguards, Stephen Markham, who has joined the group, seizes the horses by their bits and em until Emma can bring Joseph's hat and coat. Reynolds and Wilson threaten to shoot Markham if he doesn't let go of the horses, but he holds firm. There is no law on earth, says Markham, that requires a sheriff to take a prisoner without his clothes. Now a side note, I've, I've given you a little one-page handout because I've given this presentation before and one time my wife, who is uh, always brutally honest, came up to me later and said, you know, you talk about a lot of people in this thing and, and I think a lot of folks listening may be a, a bit confused. So. Rather than take the time to introduce each one and tell a story about them, I've tried to just list little cursory details about them in your handout. But the other thing that I've put there is I've tried to put their age, so far as I know it, at the time this event happened, because I want you to visualize this in terms of the people that really are. Most of them were remarkably young people, which may also account for some of the uh, emotions and feelings that, that are a part of this story. Uh, the frontier was generally a young person's place, and these were people who had immigrated further west because uh, the land was not as available in the east. And so that needs to be part of your imagination of this story. Now, as I said, I've got a movie that I want to make, and I have some pretty demanding requirements for my uh, people to play my parts. Uh, here's my idea. To play Joseph Smith, uh, I, I would like Bradley Cooper. I just think he has that, that magnetism and, and handsome good looks that I want my Joseph Smith to have. And uh, of course, Anne Hathaway would make a great Emma, wouldn't she? Uh, now, Sheriff Reynolds, uh, what about uh, B. 
Billy Bob Thornton. <laughs> and Constable Wilson, well, he has a good last name for it, Jude Law. So if you have any, if, if the agents for these gentlemen and lady are in the audience, contact me later and let's talk. All right, a little backstory. What series of events led Reynolds and Wilson to appear on the Wasson doorstep in that June day in 1843? The charges upon which Joseph was taken into custody stemmed from the 1838 Mormon troubles in Missouri when already strained relations between Mormons and their non-Mormon neighbors had boiled over. Most of you are probably familiar with the violence brought against the Mormons in what has been called the M Mormon Missouri War. Many of you will also be aware that there were instances of violence and looting that ran the other way with Mormons as perpetrators. One key skirmish of the campaign was the Battle of Crooked River in which one Missourian and three Mormons lost their lives. When Joseph finally surrendered at Far West, he was charged with treason, imprisoned for several months, and finally escaped, or was allowed to escape. For over a year, Missouri made no attempt to reclaim its Mormon prisoners. Then in September 1840, Missouri Governor Thomas Reynolds initiated extradition proceedings. Joseph was eventually arrested and appeared before Judge Stephen A. Douglas on a writ of habeas corpus and was released on what many considered was a legal technicality. Now, you may recognize this name, Stephen A. Douglas is that same man that was part of the Lincoln-Douglas debates and ran for President of the United States years later. Missouri's interest in Joseph was rekindled when ex-governor Lilburn Boggs was shot by an unseen assailant in his home on May 6, 1842. Fueled by ac accusations from Mormon apostate John C. Bennett, suspicion soon focused on Oren Porter Rockwell, the presumptive gunman, and Joseph, who was alleged to have ordered the shooting. Once again, Missouri attempted to extradite Joseph, and once again they failed, as Joseph was eventually brought eventually brought a habeas corpus petition before United States Judge Nathaniel Pope in Springfield where he was released because of deficiencies in the Boggs affidavit. And I've written more concerning that entire event in, BY, in a BYU Studies article that uh, you can read. Joseph's enemies are not pleased that he again has avoided facing the merits of charges brought against him. Almost immediately after Judge Pope's decision was announced, Bennett sets off for Missouri to stir things up. On June 13, 1843, Missouri Governor Thomas Reynolds issues another requisition for Smith and appoints Sheriff Joseph Reynolds as his agent to transport the Mormon prophet from Illinois to Missouri to stand trial for treason. Four days later, Governor Thomas Ford issues a warrant for Joseph's arrest. The warning. Fortunately, Joseph has friends in Springfield. Mormon Judge James Adams learns of the warrant and promptly dispatches an express rider to carry the news to Nauvoo. The messenger reaches his destination in the early evening on Saturday, June 17th. Unfortunately, as we have already learned, Joseph is in Palestine Grove, nearly 200 miles distant. The message is given to Hiram Smith, who reads it, and then sends for Stephen Markham and William Clayton, and asks them to ride as fast as possible to warn Joseph of the dangers. The riders carry a substantial sum of cash to aid Joseph in retaining lawyers. Riding night and day and stopping only briefly to rest their horses, Markham and Clayton arrive at the Wassons at 4 p.m. Wednesday. And when I think of this ride, uh, I, although I'm from California, my grandparents are from Utah, and we visited them every summer, and I got a chance to ride horses, which I loved because I loved Western movies. And I remember riding sometimes maybe three, four, five, six miles, and thinking, wow, that was a long ride. 
And I, I can't imagine this ride, and in the time they rode it, it was just must have been grueling for both men and horses. Uh, so riding night and day and stopping only briefly to rest their horses, Markham and Clayton arrive at the Wassons at 4 p.m. on Wednesday. Here, then, are the people that I'm thinking of to play Clayton and Markham. I like Edward Norton, and uh, for Markham, someone a little more rough who can fight off the lawmen, Viggo Mortensen. Concerned that if he started for home, he might be waylaid where he has no friends, as he put it, and spirited off to Missouri without any legal recourse, Joseph elects to stay put. Next scene, Joseph appeals to the law. The lawmen set off with their prisoner for nearby Dixon, the county seat of Lee County. They drive the wagon hard, jamming their pistols in Joseph's side most of the way, treating him very roughly indeed. On arriving in Dixon, Joseph is thrown into a room at an inn and kept under close guard. He is told he can see no one and that they will be leaving as soon as fresh horses can be secured. I want a lawyer, says Joseph, but Reynolds just curses him and says he'll shoot him if he utters another word. Later, as he is looking out his window, Joseph spies a citizen passing the room and shouts, I'm falsely in prison here. I need a lawyer. Well, as you can imagine, this is quite enough to bring lawyers. Indeed, uh, two lawyers showed up. Uh, <clears throat> now, one of them was named Edward Southwick, and he plays a role in the story. He, he was one of the leading lawyers of Dixon. And after withstanding some threats against him by Reynolds, Southwick is eventually permitted to meet with Joseph, who shows him the bruises on his sides from the pistol whipping he has received. A messenger is sent to the master in chancery with an application for a writ of habeas corpus. Another messenger is sent for Cyrus Walker, who happens to be in a nearby city. Walker is a highly regarded attorney and a well-known Whig politician who is running for seat in the United States Congress. And Joseph understands that enlisting him in the cause could be highly advantageous. In the meantime, Markham sues out several writs against Reynolds and Wilson for threatening his life, for assaulting Joseph, and for falsely imprisoning Joseph. This is an important tactical maneuver as it gives the Dixon constable grounds to arrest Reynolds and Wilson. The next morning, Cyrus Walker appears. He tells Joseph that he uh, is out electioneering and cannot justify devoting time to act as Joseph's lawyer unless, unless Joseph promises to vote for him doesn't sound like a politician. <laughs> Since Walker is considered the best criminal lawyer in that part of Illinois, Joseph agrees. And uh, here's my candidate to play Cyrus Walker, uh, Alan Rickman. At, I see we have some Rickman fans. At 10 o'clock a.m., the Dixon court convenes and orders a $10,000 bail in Joseph's claim against his captors for false imprisonment. Since neither Reynolds nor Wilson have ready access to such a sum, they are required to remain in the custody of Sheriff Campbell of Lee County. The court then orders the parties to appear before Judge Caton in Ottawa to have the return on their petitions of habeas corpus heard. And for those of you who are not lawyers, there's probably one or two out there, uh, typically a habeas corpus petition can be granted by a very low-level judge but to have an actual hearing on the merits of that petition requires someone of greater authority and, and ordinarily a circuit judge would be thought of as having that authority and Judge Caton was the nearest one. Uh, William Clayton and one of the older Wasson boys, Harmon, uh, go back to Nauvoo to obtain reinforcements as there are rumors floating around that a boat with a company of armed men will be waiting at Ottawa to carry Joseph to Missouri. At about the same time, Emma and the children leave for Nauvoo in a wagon driven by Harmon's brother, Lorenzo. 
The main party that sets out that day is a curious one indeed. It includes Joseph and his team of lawyers, which have now swelled to four, Joseph's bodyguard, Stephen Markham, Sheriff Reynolds, Constable Wilson, their lawyer, and Lee County Sheriff Campbell. Smith is in the custody of Reynolds and Wilson, who are in turn in the custody of Sheriff Campbell. Can't you just imagine the possibilities for humorous dialogue that this unconventional arrangement might provide? The group proceeds as far as Paw Paw Grove on Saturday and checks into a local inn. Next scene, Paw Paw Grove, Illinois, and I don't make these names up, folks. They're in the record. <laughs> now, to understand this scene, you need to know that the citizens of Illinois generally didn't have much respect for Missourians. In fact, the commonly used nickname for someone from Missouri was puke. <laughs> the news of the arrival of the Smith party spreads quickly at Paw Paw. By early Sunday morning, the largest room in the inn is filled with local citizens asking the celebrated prophet to preach to them. Before he can do so, however, Reynolds enters the room and orders the crowd to disperse. Joe Smith is my prisoner and I'm not going to permit this gathering, he says. At this point, one of the locals, who's described as an aged gentleman, named David Town, advances toward Reynolds. Town is lame and carries a hickory walking stick, which he pounds on the floor to get the attention of the crowd. Addressing Reynolds, he says, You damned infernal puke! We'll learn you to come here and interrupt gentlemen. Sit down there, pointing to a very low chair, and sit still. Don't open your head till General Smith gets through talking. You cannot kidnap a man here, even if you do in Missouri. And if you attempt it, well, there's a committee in this grove that will sit on your case. And, sir, it is the highest tribunal in the United States. As from its decision, there is no appeal. Well, who should we get to play Father Town? For the benefit of the recording, it's Clint Eastwood. <laughs> and obviously disconcerted, Reynolds then relents, and Joseph preaches to the assembly on, of all things, the law of God as regards marriage. Now, this was during a time when Joseph secretly practiced plural marriage. In less than two weeks, he would dictate to William Clayton the revelation that was to become section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And I wonder what he said in the sermon that day. While the group is at Paw Paw Grove, they learn that Judge Caton is on a visit to New York and will be unavailable to hear the return of the writ of habeas corpus. With considerable consternation, realizing that they have wasted two days, the party heads back to Dixon to obtain revised writs. The next morning, the Dixon magistrate issues writs that are returnable before the nearest tribunal in the 5th Judicial District authorized to hear and determine writs of habeas corpus. By phrasing the writ in generic terms, the group hopes to avoid the problem of having to return to Dixon if they find that a particular judge is unavailable, although they all assume the writ will be heard by Judge Stephen A. Douglas in Quincy. Meanwhile, back in Nauvoo. When William Clayton arrives back in Nauvoo on Sunday afternoon, a general meeting is taking place at the temple site. Clayton locates Hiram Smith and quickly tells him what he knows. A ripple of whispered conversation goes through the crowd as they become aware of Clayton's presence. Hiram strides to the stand, interrupts the speaker, and calls for a meeting of the Masonic fraternity at the lodge in 30 minutes. The brethren who assemble there at the appointed time are so numerous that they cannot be accommodated in the Masonic Hall, and so they adjourn to the green and form a hollow square. Hiram tells what he has heard from Clayton about Joseph's plight. Who will volunteer, asks Hiram, to be part of a relief force to go to the aid of Brother Joseph? More than 300 hands shoot up, and from these, two groups are formed. One, commanded by Generals Wilson Law and Charles C. Rich of the Nauvoo Legion, is made up of about 175 men on horseback. 
This brigade sets out from Nauvoo on Monday morning, spreading out across the countryside in order to cover all possible roads, inquiring of everyone they meet for news of Joseph's whereabouts. The second group, made up of 75 men, form on board the Maid of Iowa, a riverboat captained by Dan Jones. Their task is to steam up the Illinois River and examine any boats they pass for signs that Joseph is on board. The tide turns. Early Tuesday morning, Joseph's party leaves for Dixon, de leaves Dixon for the second time, heading, as they suppose, for Quincy. Later that day, they meet the first two members of the Nauvoo Legion contingent. Joseph clasps both men's hands simultaneously, and his enormous relief causes tears to stream down his cheeks. He turns to the group and says, I won't be going to Missouri this time. These are my boys. During the next two days, the party continues to travel south toward Quincy and is joined by more and more of the men of the Nauvoo Legion. On Thursday afternoon, a consultation takes place that is to have profound implications for Joseph's defense. It will be recalled that the replacement writ of habeas corpus obtained in Dixon has made the writ returnable before the nearest tribunal authorized to hear and determine writs of habeas corpus. It should also be borne that at this stage of his life, Joseph is well versed in administrative, legislative, and legal affairs. He's the mayor of Nauvoo, presides over the city council, and is chief judge of the municipal court. Two years earlier, concerned that Joseph might be extradited in connection with the Boggs case, the city council began passing a series of laws that greatly expanded the municipal court's powers, not only to issue writs of habeas corpus, but also to hear and determine them. This assumption of power by a municipal court was quite controversial. Joseph now informs his lawyer, however, that these ordinances, of these ordinances, and points out that Nauvoo is nearer their current location than Quincy. The team of defense lawyers considers Joseph's suggestion and concludes it has merit. This understandably gladdens Joseph's heart. And just as understandably, the prospect of a trial to be heard in Smith's home court mortifies Reynolds and Wilson. <clears throat> a triumphant return. A messenger sent by Joseph to inform Nauvoo of the latest development arrives early Friday morning, and the news sets the town buzzing. Hiram and Emma Smith mount their horses and ride out to meet the incoming party. The Nauvoo Brass Band assembles and marches out as well, along with a train of carriages containing many of the leading citizens of the city. This is so cinematic. <clears throat> the members of the Nauvoo Legion who are riding with Joseph's party decorate their bridles with flowers of the prairie. When they are about a mile and a half east of the temple, the procession from Nauvoo meets up with them. Sensing the occasion is ripe for ceremony, Joseph arranges his special lifeguards in their appropriate positions. Reynolds and Wilson and the lawyers are riding the stagecoach. Sheriff Campbell and a company of about 140 militiamen follow on horseback. The band strikes up Hail Columbia, and the entire group marches slowly toward the city, with Emma and Joseph riding side by side at their head. They are greeted with the cheers of the citizens of Nauvoo, who line the street on both sides. The noise is deafening as guns and cannons are fired. When Joseph arrives at his home at about 1 o'clock p.m., his aged mother Lucy is at the door to embrace him and his children cling to him. The crowd seems unwilling to disperse, and finally Joseph climbs up on a fence, thanks them for their kindness, and blesses them all. He tells them that he will address them at the grove near the temple in three hours. Then he sits down to dinner with his family and 50 of his friends. Sheriff Reynolds and Constable Wilson are seated at the head of the table and are personally waited on by Emma and Lucy Smith. You know, what the, what the story in the, in the official history doesn't mention is the scurrying that went around by, I'm assuming, the Relief Society sisters to get this dinner put together. I do think that story needs to be told. <clears throat> After dinner, Joseph proceeds to the grove as promised and delivers an address to the people who have assembled to hear of his adventure. Their prophet's arrest and the danger of being taken to Missouri 
has been the chief topic of conversation among the citizens of Nauvoo for the past week. So the gathering number is in the thousands. Joseph's speech is flamboyant and aggressive. No doubt enormously relieved to be back among his people, he seems to give little regard to the impact his words might have had if they had become known to the non-Mormon citizens of Illinois. In other words, he didn't have a good public relations department. He makes it clear that he has no intention of again submitting to outside authority. I have dragged these men here by my hand and will do it again, but I swear I will not deal so mildly with them again, for the time has come when forbearance is no longer a virtue, and if you or I are taken unlawfully, you are at liberty to give loose to blood and thunder. And then Joseph's voice rings out with a challenge. Before I will be dragged away again among my enemies for trial, I will spill the last drop of blood in my veins and will see all my enemies in hell. To bear it any longer would be a sin, and I will not bear it any longer. Shall we bear it any longer? At this, one universal no runs through the entire assembly like a loud peal of thunder. Returning to the attack, Joseph has some words of warning for his enemies. If we have to give up our chartered rights, we will do it only at the port point of sword and bayonet. If mobs come upon you any more here, dung your gardens with them. Now, as a sidelight, I, I was glad that I've Michael Ash mentioned, and, and others have, that we don't need our prophets to be perfect individuals, and we are fine with them being human. I think Joseph may have gotten a little carried away, and I say that particularly because of the next quote that I have from him. During the course of this speech, uh, Joseph provides some interesting advice about lawyers. Don't employ lawyers or pay them money for their knowledge, for I have learned that they don't know anything. I know more than they all. Uh, I try to keep that hidden from my Mormon clients. For f <clears throat> a common legal saying holds that he who represents himself has a fool for a lawyer. Uh, Joseph is no fool. He continues to hire and pay lawyers, and usually the best. Joseph then speaks about his un upcoming court hearing demonstrating that he understands the extraordinary reach of the Nauvoo habeas corpus ordinance, he proclaims, we have more power than most charters confer because we have power to go behind the writ and try the merits of the case. In asserting the power of the Nauvoo court to consider the underlying merits in a habeas corpus proceeding, Joseph is opening up a controvers controversial ground. Although legal authority was mixed, the general practice in Illinois seemed to be that such a proceeding would not delve into the merits of the claim underlying the arrest. That was ordinarily reserved for trial. The question to be determined at the habeas corpus proceeding was typically whether the arrest appeared on its face to be legal. In other words, whether it was supported by the proper paperwork. The Nauvoo City Council, however, had passed an ordinance providing that even if the court was to determine the writ had been properly issued, it could hear testimony on the merits of the underlying action and dismiss the defendant if it found that the action had been brought through private pique, malicious intent, or religious or other persecution, falsehood, or misrepresentation. The next scene, the municipal court hears the case. The following day, on Saturday, July 1st, the municipal court meets for an all-day hearing. Joseph, who is Chief Justice, recuses himself and Associate Justice William Marks, the Nauvoo State President, acts as chief. Joseph, notwithstanding his remarks of the previous day, is represented by four lawyers, led by Cyrus Dick Walker. The habeas corpus petition lists ten reasons why Joseph's wrist is invalid. The primary one, however, is that Joseph is not guilty of treason as charged, and this will become the focus of the testimony. The defense calls six witnesses, Hiram Smith, Parley Pratt, Brigham Young, George Pitkin, Lyman White, and Sidney Rigdon. The prosecution does not call any witnesses, of course, as any such would be far away in Missouri. 
As you might expect, the trial of testimony is entirely one-sided. Favorable acts are exaggerated, and unfavorable ones are glossed over. Of course, it is easy to see with the benefit of hindsight the one-sidedness of the proceedings. Wilford Woodruff's reaction is probably more typical of Mormons who heard the testimony. He records, it was certainly the most heart-wrenching scene or rehearsal of it that ever saluted the ears of any tribunal. In a civilized government, it would have disgraced an Arab or a Hottentot. My blood was boiled within, and the spirit of war rested upon me for the space of two days. To no one's surprise, after the long day of testimony, the court orders Joseph to be dismissed, discharged from his arrest. Reynolds and Wilson petition Governor Ford to call out the Illinois militia, but he declines to intervene. The aftermath, and I picture perhaps a narrator over images on the screen with this one. For the most part, the non-Mormon populace views the events that began in Palestine Grove as an abuse of the writ of habeas corpus, yet another example of the Mormons placing themselves above the law. The Alton Telegraph reports with sarcasm, Smith obtained a writ of habeas corpus and was taken before that very impartial and disinterested legal tribunal, the Municipal Court of Nauvoo. The officers of this misnamed court of justice are composed of the most unprincipled of Joe's deluded followers, and the result was precisely what every man of common sense might have known it would be, a discharge of the prophet. The telegraph then expressed a sentiment undoubtedly felt by many in Illinois. Governed by no political principles whatever, the Mormons at every election throw themselves in the market like cattle for sale. The result is their blasphemies, their violations of law, their utter disregard of all social relations of life are permitted to progress with impunity. And when justice is attempted to be visited upon them, the arm of the law is found to be too short to reach them. Now, why do I mention these unfavorable reports? Because I think if we as students of history are to really understand history, we need to know that there wasn't there were two sides to the story, and we need to understand the other side. And so this gives you an idea of what people were thinking as a result of this tribunal. As if to prove the point made in the register, uh, two days before the election, Joseph Smith has a change of heart concerning whether the Missourians should support the Whig, Walker, or the Democrat, Joseph Hoag. Mindful of his promise to vote for Walker, Joseph states at a public meeting in Nauvoo that he will do so. But, Brother Hiram tells me this morning that he has had a testimony that it will be better for this people to vote for Hoag. And I never knew one of Hiram's revelations to fail. Hidden message there. Hoag wins the election on the strength of the Mormon vote, and the Whigs never forgave them. According to Governor Ford, from this time forth, the Whigs generally, and part of the Democrats, determined upon driving the Mormons out of the state, and everything connected with Mormons became political. Well, here's a conclusion. From the Mormon standpoint, Joseph Smith's ability to beat down Missouri's third attempt to extradite him is a clear case of good prevailing over evil. Joseph's arrest at Palestine Grove was the result of religious prejudice and fraud and amounted to little better than a kidnapping. The municipal court has merely dispensed justice by releasing him. From the non-Mormon standpoint, Joseph's release by the Nauvoo court is yet another example of a dangerous exercise of political power by a religious sect that cannot be trusted. This episode convinces many in Illinois that the Mormons have to be dealt with severely and serves as a prelude to the Carthage murders that are to occur the following year. While the destruction of the Nauvoo Expositor will become the match that ignites the flame, the actions of the Mormon militia in the Nauvoo court in delivering Joseph from his Missouri enemies might be thought of as highly flammable bits of tinder. Thank you.
I think we have a time for a few questions if there are some. <laughs> what do you think of Benedict Cumberbatch as Joseph Smith? <laughs> well, my wife would go along with that. What is habeas corpus and a writ of habeas corpus? Well, that's a good question. I, I did try to explain that briefly, but essentially, habeas corpus is a translate, translated from the Latin means, show me the body. What it is, it's a way for a prisoner to go into court, or be, before even a lower magistrate, and say, look, these people have arrested me, but they have no just cause. And, uh, and so I want someone to at least consider the propriety of that arrest. So even a, the lower magistrate, like a justice of the peace, could issue a, writ of, or a, issue a habeas corpus writ, but it had to be heard, the merits of it needed to go to a higher tribunal. And as I mentioned, in those days in Illinois, typically it went to one of the circuit judges. The circuit judges were members of the Illinois Supreme Court who rode the circuit on horseback and visited each of the, of the county seats and held court for a period of a week or two and then moved on to the next county. And these would be the gentlemen that normally would hear the return on habeas corpus. In this case, that return was heard by the Nauvoo Municipal Court presided over by William Marks. And the other question here is exactly the same one. What is a writ of habeas corpus? So I'm glad I answered that one. Is that it? Thank you very much.